Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. Hello, everybody. This is Elizabeth coming to you from our annual late summer break. Instead of a regular episode of Hear Her Sports podcast, I am going to be sharing an episode of Keep the Flame Alive podcast, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. Keep the Flame Alive is created by fellow female hosts and producers of podcast, Allison and Jill. It comes out weekly and during the games, has daily shows with insider information about everything that is going on there. Jill and Allison were even accredited for the Beijing 2022 Olympics and the Paralympics. They spent the entire games in Beijing covering what was going on there with the events, the athletes, COVID protocols, and the strange busing situation. What I love about the show is the fun Jill and Allison have talking to each other and the love that they have for the Olympics. Episodes cover athletes and also views of how the games work and function, so everything from organization, travel, the transportation of equipment, coaching, refing, broadcasting, venues, and so much more. The episode I'm sharing here features Team USA Nordic Combined athlete Annika Malasinski. Nordic Combined is the only sport on the current Olympic program only open to men, In the conversation with Annika, learn about what Nordic Combined is, some of the strange details of the sport, including the odd outfit, and how there are still those who think doing hard sporty things can cause a woman's uterus to fall out. You can find more about Keep the Flame Alive at flamealivepod.com or they are on all social at flamealivepod. Before we get going, remember to take advantage of the discount code from our new sponsor, The Feed, to get 15% off pretty much everything at thefeed.com. Use the code FORWARD15. You may notice that this is a new code. No worries at all. Hear Her 15 still works, but we all decided that one code for the entire Female Athlete Podcast Network made much more sense. So check them out. Enjoy some new nutrition products or ones you've long used and support a company that is supporting women's sports. Thank you to The Feed for sponsoring the Female Athlete Podcast Network, Keeping Her Forward, which includes Strides Forward and Keeping Track Podcasts, as well as Hear Her Sports. I'm now going to let Jill and Allison take over for the rest of the episode. Please enjoy. Bye-bye. This episode is sponsored by Winter Victor Studio. Mesdames et messieurs, the greatest festival of our contemporary society, the Olympic Games, is about to begin. This is going to be close. Oh! They're all completely gassed! They've given it everything on the global bucket! Oh, yeah! Oh! Oh! Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! But that is an Olympic champion. Ready. Hello, fans of Shook Liston, and welcome to another episode of Keep the Flame Alive, the podcast for fans of the Olympics and Paralympics. I am your host, Jill Jarris, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Allison Brown. Allison, hello. How are you? I'm feeling very unaccomplished. How so? Well, it, it feeds into our interview today when we, we spoke to our guest today. She had gone on a run before we spoke to her very early in the morning. And now you've gone on a bike ride as we're recording very early in the morning. And I kind of rolled out of bed and did my best to not sound like <laughs> Ethel, our friend who comes out every once in a while. So I'm feeling very behind 
everyone this week. That's okay. I'm, I only did an early bike ride today because it's going to be in the 90s. And yesterday it got to be 102 degrees on our home-based weather system. And it was 107 with the heat index. Today will be cooler, but it's going to be another brutal heat wave. It's like running the marathon in Japan. <laughs> Very true, except for I have no Sapporo to take the podcast recording business up to. <laughs> we need people to just like throw water cups at you <laughs> as you go by. I will take that. We would like to thank our sponsor today, Winter Victor Studio. Winter Victor believes sport and beautiful design go hand in hand and that a designer's versatility is just as important as an athlete's dexterity. Winter Victor de provides distinctive graphic design to clients in sport, from logos to digital communications. Winter Victor brings the same passion to design that our clients bring to the field of play. Add a responsive and versatile designer to your team at wintervictor.com. Hopefully today talking about a winter sport will make me feel chilly, but we are talking Nordic Combined. Nordic Combined is the only sport on the current Olympic program that is only open to men. Many athletes are working to change that, including Team USA's Annika Malasinski. Annika tried ski jump for the first time at age 16 and only a year later was named to the national team in Women's Nordic Combined. She competed in the first ever win Women's Nordic Combined World Cup and World Championships during the 2020-21 season and hopes to see the event added to the schedule for the 2026 Olympics. While we're a ways from the start of the Nordic Combined season, this next week is really important for this event as the IOC is set to decide on women's inclusion at Milan Cortina 2026. We will have more on how you can help after the interview. Take a listen to our talk with Annika Malasinski. All right, Annika, uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a while since we've talked Nordic Combined, so let's talk a little bit about the sport. It's ski jumping and then cross-country racing. What drew you to it? Yeah, so basically I actually have a very unique story on how I kind of came into Women's Nordic Combined. I was a gymnast for 14 years, and I was doing it at a very elite level, so I was in the gym about 24 hours a week. And it got to a point where my body just could not handle the tumbling, the vaulting, just it became so much on my body. And I went through a very like kind of depressive episode of not having gymnastics, and I was one of those kids that did every single sport, like you name a sport and I did it. So my whole life, I felt like my purpose was being an athlete and sports and whatnot. So when kind of gymnastics was taken away from me, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I was 16 at the time, so I didn't even think that I could like start up a new sport. But my brother, Nicholas Malasinski, he's actually been doing Nordic Mind since he was seven. And I went to go watch like the annual 4th of July competition here in Steamboat. And I don't know what clicked in my brain, but I saw him jump that and I was like, okay, I want to try that. So less than two weeks later, I was geared up, put into these extremely uncomfortable boots, literally cutting my circulation off. I had no idea why my skis were so long. And they sent me off the 40 meter jump because in the summer in Steamboat, that is the smallest ski jump. <laughs> So I would say that was probably one of the most exhilarating, but also so scary being at the top of that 40 meter jump, having no experience with ski jumping and being just like, yeah, OK, let's let's let go of this bar and get into this track and jump. <laughs> so um, it was crazy. But like I am a complete adrenaline junkie. And when I got up in the air and flew like the two meters I did, I was just so hooked on this flying feeling and it's been four years since that jump actually coming up in August and I am just like looking back at it like I've gone through a crazy adventure and journey with Nordic combined but I'm so glad that I decided to try it at 16 years old. Why Nordic combined versus just staying with ski jumping? So I grew up with a very athletic mother. So she was actually trying to go to the Olympics for swimming when she was 
about 18, but unfortunately got very sick and that was not a possibility for her anymore. But um, she put me, or she kind of knew like why endurance sports were so important. So yeah, my mom was like super wanted to put me and my brother into endurance sports. So as her being a swimmer at our age, she forced swimming and forced cross country skiing. So at the time, I wasn't a fan of endurance sports. I really loved my gymnastics. Um, I like doing soccer, you know, horseback riding, but she pushed it like very aggressively. <laughs> so, I mean, thanks to her, you know, I am able to do Nordic Combined because I have a skiing background. But yeah, it was, I didn't even think about going into ski jumping just because I wanted to follow in my little brother's footsteps, which is kind of hard saying. But yeah, he had always done Nordic combined and I had a skiing background. So yeah, I feel like it it was never even an option to go into just ski jumping. How is the impact of a ski jump landing compared to the impact of landing gymnastics tricks? That's actually a good question. I've actually never gotten that question before, but I think ski jumping landings you look at the ski jump and you think that you're coming in hard and fast but honestly like when you're gliding in the air you're a lot of people think that you're way up in the air but you're actually pretty close to the ski jump so coming in really should be pretty graceful and it's really not much impact at all but as a gymnast I feel like it was a lot of impact especially especially tumbling and then vault. And it was just so hard on your joints, like flipping through the air and then coming in on a blind spot and trying to land it and, you know, not take a step or jump out of bounds. So I think, yeah, ski jumping is just, it's more graceful coming into the landing. And then once you've done it for so long, you kind of know what you like expect and want to feel, I guess. Is the flexibility from gymnastics help or hindrance? Oh my God, I can't, I can't thank gymnastics enough because I can truthfully say that if I did not do gymnastics for 14 years of my life and then just sporadically try to do ski jumping, it would not have worked. Gymnastics gave me my flexibility, which is extremely important in the ski jumping world. It gave me body awareness, coordination, balance. It gave me so much. The only thing that I would have to complain about with these two sports, like going from gymnastics to ski jumping, is it took me a full year to realize that I like pointing my toes versus flexing them in the air. So, yeah, it was a long process to try to figure this out. And I mean, I remember I had a Hungarian Olympic coach in gymnastics and the amount of times he would yell at us to point our toes straight in our knees, like the form had to be there. And then for all of a sudden going to ski jumping where it's like, no, you want to do the opposite. Like you want to bring your toes up and have as much flex as you as possible in the air. It was just like so hard for my brain to comprehend this. And um, it was not good because I mean, when you point your toes and ski jumping, I mean, your skis are falling away from you. So I think that was like the only thing that was really hard jumping from both sports. <laughs> Do you ever have to fight the urge to salute the judges before you go down the (laughs) the ski ramp? Definitely one of my signature moves, I feel like. So in ski jumping, you come down in a telemark and that's where you get like points. So in no means do you want to just like come down. You're supposed to be in a telemark, make it look pretty. I, my fingers were always like in this gymnastics and like I would come down and I'm just like, in my little gymnastics dainty fingers and I think my coach spotted out he's like are you like what are you doing with your fingers when you go in your telemark I'm like oh my god because like I mean when you're in gymnastics that that's all it is with these like dainty beautiful fingers and so I still I still actually do that like world cups and whatnot if you rewatch the videos like I come down and my fingers are out (laughs) that's gonna change ski jumping I bet. <laughs> That's, I'm I, serious. I, you know? I hope so. I mean, I'm hoping that I'm getting more points from the judges when they're seeing my little fingers come out. <laughs> it's very delicate. Yeah, very. <laughs> One question I have about 
the cross country aspect is there's a lot of summer competition as well. How does mm-hmm. roller skiing different from skiing on snow? The feel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it definitely is different. Like the first ski on snow after summer training is really hard on your body. Like my shins get so sore. So the skis that you ski on in um, cross country, they're like pretty long. I'd say they're about one, like I ski on like 187s versus roller skis are short. And I mean, they're definitely heavier because you have the two wheels and the brim is usually metal. So I definitely say it's, it's, they're shorter, they're heavier, and you just don't get the same feeling when you're like skiing on concrete versus snow. When you're skiing on concrete, the conditions are always the same. On snow, you have to have the right wax, the right grind, like there's so much going into skiing. But I mean, it is a very great way to practice skiing in the summertime. And I was fortunate enough, like we have ski jumping and cross country skiing in the summertime versus like alpine skiers. I know it gets a little bit harder with that aspect. So women in the sport, the sore spot with us and obviously you, this is the one sport where there's no women's element in the Olympics yet. And a lot of that is participation stemming from the fact that women's uteruses are supposed to fly out when you ski jump. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and and dealing with the history, I can imagine that the pandemic has had a lousy effect on the movement for women. How has the pandemic affected things? So, yeah, it definitely is a very sore spot for a lot of like us women that are, you know, doing the same things that the guys are doing, but we just don't have the Olympic Games. And I mean, when you're looking at like history in Nordic mine, it goes back a hundred years. I mean, men were competing without helmets, going off crazy jumps, and it never really came to women until pretty recently. And um, it's been really frustrating, I guess, because I mean, women's Nordic mine is a small field. We do have usually about a full field of 30 girls in World Cups and whatnot. And um, it's hard to be at the same competitions as the guys. And of course, I mean, we are making progress. Last year, we had five World Cup weekends. Now we're going to have eight World Cup weekends. So we are on a slow rise. But it was so hard to be watching the Olympics this winter. It's so cool. And I want to be rooting for my teammates and the men and just everyone that has worked their butts off to be at the Olympics. But it's so hard knowing that like not even a lot of people know that women's Nordic combined isn't in the Olympics. I catch myself trying to educate people all the time and try to sp- spread awareness about it in a way where, you know, we still in the 21st century live in a world of inequality with we- women and men. And um, it's been really hard to try to process that. And then now they're making the decision if it's going to be in 26 in Milano, Italy, and the IOC, that's their decision. And I don't think people have realized how quick our sport has come to this rise. I mean, these women are very, very good. And I don't think people realize that like over the course of four years, has our sport like gotten to this point where we're at the World Cup and these women are like kicking everyone's And it's also been very cool for me because when I started at 16, I've been going through like all the firsts for women's Nordic combined. So I got to go to the first ever fist women youth fist cup and then the first continental cups and the first world cup and the first world championship. So I have been seeing a lot of progress, but it is also frustrating to still our sport isn't in the Olympics. So I'm hoping that they make, the right decision coming into 26, I think it would be really detrimental, especially for the men as well, because they make their money off of views and who watches. And personally, I think a lot of people would watch the women, not just the men. And with the pandemic, it was definitely hard traveling, wearing a mask everywhere, like going on your outside runs before the warm up before your ski jumping. I mean, you had to wear a mask. But I've been also seeing progress, so we have to look at the bright side. But at the same time, it is very hard to 
not be at like the top what everyone dreams about being up there so and it's yeah. a catch-22 when it's not in the olympics mm-hmm. people are going to choose to either compete in ski jumping or cross country which is but to get in the olympics you need participation so there's exactly. that, weird, that exactly. weird dichotomy all around it would be detrimental for our sport I mean, it's been a dream of mine as a little girl to go to the Olympics. I thought it would be for gymnastics, but um, now I'm hoping it would be for Nordic Combined. And how cool would that be to be at the first ever Women's Nordic Combined Olympics? But also you have to make decisions for yourself. And if the IOC is not recognizing the progress in our sport, then even I feel like I would think about maybe going into ski jumping, which is awful to say I'm, I'm not trying to put a message out there that if you don't get what you want then quit but um it it just shows that people don't care and they're not ready to put in the work for getting like women's nordic combined at the top level so how involved have some of the female ski jumpers been in helping you because they just went through this less Mm -hmm. than 10 years ago to get it into the sport. So have you been getting support from those women? I feel like anybody that knows that uh, our sport isn't in the Olympics, which I mean, I've gotten a lot of social media coverage about it, which has been really awesome and try to educate the world that we still live in a place where women can't participate in things that men can. But I think Everybody that kind of knows about it has supported us. And I know a lot of people that have written letters to the IOC trying to get our sport up there. But yeah, it, it's it's hard. So I think that they definitely can sympathize with us and be em- empathetic and whatnot. <laughs> you talked about the expansion of the world, the Women's World Cup race schedule. How does that compare to the men's schedule? Obviously, um, even though we have been getting more competitions, it's nowhere near what the guys get. Even the prize money is completely different. But, you know, like I said, I've also been seeing a lot of progress with it. Three years ago, we had one World Cup, like one, one single one. And um, then last year, we got five World Cup weekends, actually four, because one was canceled. And then um, this season, we're going to be getting eight, hopefully. So yeah, it's it's cool to see that at least someone is trying in the background. So we just had a conversation with the ski jumping coach about suits mm-hmm. and all the issues regarding suits. So I'm wondering if that is also an issue, because in the, in the Olympics with the women's ski jumping, we saw a lot of disqualification because of suits is that also an issue in Nordic combined yeah I think people don't realize how much goes in to ski jumping and the rules and all the measurements we have to do everything has to be perfect to try to prevent cheating which is a great thing but um when I'm trying to tell people about like the measurements we have to get and what reasons we might get disqualified on they're always like sitting there like what the heck like there's it's so like niche but yeah, there's definitely a lot of disqualification disqualifications that go on in competition. And I think rightfully so, just, you know, we're trying to prevent cheating. But at the same time, ski jumping suits are pretty hard to make. And it's not like they go into secondhand use unless you're donating to your local club or whatnot. But they are, there's so much that goes into it, you know. I don't think in any other sport you talk more about your crotch. <laughs> um, you need to get <laughs> you need to get crotch measurements. Your ski jumping suit has to align to your crotch measurement, and before every competition, they measure your crotch. And so it's hard for you know the ones that are making it in the background, and then especially on the U.S. side, since USA Nordic is not government funded. We don't get a lot of funding for suits, skis, literally anything. So looking at the the top athletes in the world, they're Norway, Austria, Slovenia. They have top tier people that make their suits because they have the funding and money for it. So I think that's, that's really a big one that we're fighting with is funding. And um, to have like these very professional made suits, you need to have money. So that that's a big one for sure. How how much does a suit cost? 
do you pay for them or are you they part of your USA Nordic stuff? Since I'm on the national team, I actually don't pay for them. But I remember my first ever professionally made suit. Because usually as you start as a kid or like I started, you use suits that have already been used probably on many different people already. So I actually started on a men's ski jumping suit. And um, I am actually like, I'm a very curvy person. And I remember like putting on these ski jumping suits that are made for men and um they would not fit me (laughs) they'd be skin tight and they definitely weren't supposed to look like that but i remember when i got my first professionally made suit in austria by a company named dolly so they measure your body and they make suits accordingly i think i paid about four hundred dollars for a suit that was made for your body and uh, let me tell you, that suit was phenomenal to jump in. It was a great, it was a great start. What's the difference between a, a suit that's fit for you versus a generic suit? Honestly, I mean, everybody's body is very different, especially for women. We have an extra panel in our hips because our hips are bigger than men's. So a men's ski jumping suit is basically just like straight down, but we have an extra panel for our hips. And then also, it's just way more comfortable. I mean, in general speaking, like ski jumping boots, they are not comfortable. Ski jumping suits are not comfortable. They, especially in the summertime, our suits are made out of foam. So it's kind of like a microfiber foam and it's about half an inch of a layer. And so imagine summertime, sweating your ass off, going up to the ski jump, sitting in the sun. I mean... It's awful. I am just dripping in sweat. And so I guess comfort, which isn't really saying much. (laughs) What is it like going through measurement time at competition? Yeah, so there is a lot of, I wouldn't say rules, but um, we get taught how to be measured. So basically, our crotch, we're trying to get it as low as possible so we can have that extra fabric between our feet to our crotch in our ski jumping suits so when you're getting measured there people are trying to get the perfect measurement to have a good season if that makes sense so this is kind of hard to explain but when you're you basically you sit on or you stand against a wall and they have a crotch measuring machine so it's this kind of like metal piece and they bring it up to your crotch (laughs) I know this to me. I mean, I'm so used to this that it's like it it doesn't even phase me anymore. But to other people, they're like, what the hell? <laughs> so they they obviously we us women have a woman measure and then the men have a men measure. But we have to stand in our underwear and sports bra and we get onto this little machine and a shoulder width apart with our feet. And they bring up this metal piece and they check your crotch. And um, generally speaking, you're trying to stay as low as possible to the ground. And then they check your height at the same time. And your upper body, you want to have as, like, tall as possible. So it's really just really awkward. It's an awkward stance because you're trying to get your butt to the ground and then also have, like, a long upper body. So they take your measurement as well with your upper body. And then you need to get your arms measured. And generically speaking, you want to have it like this. But people are trying to, like, get their shoulder back because you want a shorter measurement for your arms. So you can have as much fabric around your body so it catches in there better. So it's, yeah, your chicken wings, your butt is to the ground. It, it's, it doesn't look very <laughs> comfortable, let's just say. So are ski jumpers doing yoga training to be able to be measured properly? Yeah, I'd say definitely. There, I mean, People will practice because, I mean, if you don't get a good measurement through the season, so let's say that your crotch measurement is super high, then technically speaking, the people that are making your suits need to like go with these measurements. So you're not going to get disqualified. So going into the season, it is so important that you get good measurements with your body. Yeah, it's it is really crucial. So how often are you measured? So. I have summer Grand Prix competitions coming up at end of August into September. So before that, I will be measured. And then sometimes they will measure you before the season, the winter season. So I'd say about one to two times a year. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're you're stuck on the crotch measurement, aren't you? I Jill? am. I just when it's games time, we have a little feature called "What officiating a volunteer job would you want to do?" I can tell you, this is not on my list of jobs <laughs> I would want to do. <laughs> I just I can envision a very stern I mean, European woman, maybe German, yeah. being like, "Ah, get your arms straight." <laughs> yeah. Totally. Absolutely. It is exactly like that. And like I said, like we talk about crotch so much, like I have a male, male coach and we talk about crotch all the time. And I think for other sports that would be insanely weird, but at this point I am so used to it. (laughs) So the idea of the extra fabric, just, it it sounds like it almost works like a sail. Like it gives you some loft to to have a little bit of extra piece. Yeah. At the end of the day, you are really looking to have as much fabric as you can around your armpits or your crotch, um, your legs. So I guess the more fabric you have, the more lift you're going to get in the air. So, yeah. So practical things. You've got ski jump, you do cross country, you do it all in the same day. Mm -hmm. You're changing suits, speaking of suits, and you're changing all the skis. How is the transition happening? And you're getting from place to place. Yeah, so I think one of the biggest struggles is traveling. You're not only traveling with ski jumping skis. I am also traveling with nine pairs of cross-country skis. It's just everything. Like, I have two sets of boots, two sets of skis, two sets of race suit versus ski jumping suit. So there is actually... a lot going into what I have to bring into Europe and I am always shaking in my boots trying to weigh my stuff at the airport because it is always overweight and those kiosk people just they don't care at all (laughs) they don't care if you're a professional athlete or just a normal person going to Florida I think that is one of the hardest parts is traveling with all the gear but It surprisingly isn't actually too bad with the competition side. We have all our ski jumping stuff at the ski jumps. And once we jump and whatnot, we usually leave it there. It's like a weekend World Cup, so we'll be there tomorrow. And then um, we go back to the hotel, and usually all my cross-country skiing stuff is there. So I just have my race suit, my boots, and then the skis are at the venue. So um, competition-wise, I wouldn't say it's it's not any different. I think the traveling part is just the hardest part. Do you eat in between the two events? Yeah. So usually we start with a ski jumping event in the morning. So I'd say that takes about an hour to two hours just getting through all the girls and whatnot. And then we go back to the hotel and usually have a lunch. So what I like to do is pasta rice anything with carbs in it and then usually a salad you try not to overeat to not feel like you're going to throw up on the race course but also get enough protein in carbs in and then to fuel your race in a way i'm still stuck on the suits i'm sorry (laughs) cross-country suits very different that is all lycra yeah, so basically spandex material. Okay. Light as possible, just really stuck on your skin, pretty tight, really light. So, when it's cold, do you layer up underneath? Yeah, so like for some instances, when we go to Finland, Lahti usually, it is insanely cold, like so, so, so cold. Sometimes anywhere from negative 20, negative 30. So, I mean, it's really crucial to be layering up under your suits. A mistake that my brother made a couple of years ago at Junior Worlds, he did not layer up enough and uh, ended up getting like severe frostbite at the end and had to go into, you know, the medic room and they put blankets on him. So it was probably not a very good time for him. But then at the end of our season last or 2021-22, we, our last competition was in Schoenach, Germany. And I'd say the weather was about 15, 20 Celsius. So very, very warm. And they were struggling to keep like the snow on the ground. I mean, it was hilarious watching. It was a whole field. And usually Schoenach is, it's a pretty flat field. You can kind of see everything around. And yeah, it was grass everywhere and the only patches that had snow was our race course 
And it was so hot, so warm. So actually in that competition, I wore my Spanx leggings and then a sports bra. It was that warm. So it definitely depends on the weather, the temperatures and whatnot. Oh, I want to say, are you moleskin or a no moleskin? Because we saw a lot of moleskin coming out at Beijing on the skiers' faces for the oh, cold. I have worn moleskin actually in Lahti, Finland, when it was that cold. But other than that, I usually run pretty warm. So even if it's really cold, my body warms up pretty fast, especially, you know, when you're skiing, you go race pace as hard as you can. Um, but in some instances, it is very important, especially when in Beijing, there was high winds. So, you know, wind burn, that's never fun. So, yeah. What is it like having a brother in the sport? Does that motivate you? Does that frustrate you because he has an Olympic path and you don't yet that we know of? Actually, it's it's really motivating being with him. He's a very highly motivated athlete. He's just great at what he does and he knows how to discipline himself to go out and train. And it's something that he loves to do, which is really awesome to see. And actually last season we were living together in Austria in a apartment, just the two of us. And it was so much fun. Like, it's just when you're with your brother, you can be your like complete goofy self. So, I mean, we were cracking jokes all the time. And it's actually really comforting having a family member when you're gone for so much of the year and not being able to be home. It's kind of taking like a piece of home with you, <laughs> if I will. And um, he motivates me so much. We do training to we do train together. So, um, yeah. I think it's really motivating and he pushes me hard and I kind of do the same. So it's definitely, and we have a very, very good relationship together. So I love training and traveling with him. And then your mom can, and your dad can keep track of you both. Cause if one isn't answering the text, where's your yeah. brother? Why is your exactly. sister answering me? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's how it usually goes. <laughs> <laughs> I know how this works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Having a small U.S. team, what is it like training-wise, camaraderie-wise, looking at other bigger teams that have more resources-wise? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge that we have to face every single day. Like I said, like our sport is not, or specifically USA Nordic, is not government-funded. So we rely on sponsors, and that's kind of what brings us the most money in it you know when you're looking at norway or austria they have loads of money that they can put in for example like making suits or coaches or wax techs so we have a lot of staff that we need especially during world cup season ideally we should have a pt a massage therapist a couple wax techs coaches ski jumping coach, cross country coach. I mean, there's so much that we could have, but we don't because we don't have the funding for it. So, I mean, looking at Norway, they have everything, anything from the PT to the massage therapist to having a gazillion wax techs that know exactly what they're doing with our skis. So it, it is a challenge that we face on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're trying to make it work. And yeah, it's been a challenge, but... Yeah. How much sharing goes on with, say, you know, the biathletes and the cross country and the ski jumpers and then the Nordic combined athletes? I'd say almost none, to be honest. So USA Nordic is ski jumping and Nordic combined. We are separate from the U.S. ski team because we they've cut our funding, I believe, in 2008. So, yeah, honestly, almost none because the ski jumpers don't have any of cross country stuff and Usually we are com doing our completely different schedules. I maybe see them once or twice in the year, world championships or bigger competitions like this. But we are basically on our own for equipment. I know the guys have some kind of agreement with Atomic, so they all share skis. We kind of get a big fleet of them and 
it, it's a lot of skis, like a hundred plus skis. Whereas I yeah. have an agreement with Mad Shoes. And so I carry about nine to 10 skis throughout the season that have different grinds on them and specific to snow conditions. How much of your day or week or month gets devoted to trying to get sponsorship and funding versus training and competition? Yeah, so funding is very important, especially going into season. And I've been on this rise with the sport. So obviously the first two to three years, I was really trying to figure out my ski jumping, cross-country skiing. I'd say the 2020-2021 season, I was really out of shape. So there's so much that goes into training and whatnot. So with the results I was getting in 2020, 2021, there's not a lot of people that would sponsor you. They would want to see like the top 10 results. And that's been a really great change seeing that coming out of last season's results, I have a lot more opportunities out there to get sponsorships and whatnot. And me and my brother actually do have um, a lot of individual sponsors that like to help us out and um, buy plane tickets for us. So it's a really, it's a big relief on my family and me knowing that I can in the future maybe be fully funded going into the seasons. And from based on last year's results, I did make the A team. So I should be fully covered going into next season. How much does it help that you have dual citizenship with Finland? and can leverage both markets in a way. Yeah, so, I mean, my whole life has kind of been crazy. It hasn't been like anyone else's. I did first semester in Finland and then second semester in the U.S., all the way up to my senior year of high school. So, yeah, I had, I definitely lived a double life, and I'm so fortunate to be able to have cultural experiences like that. And, um, yeah, so it was... It was an amazing life that I had, and it gave me opportunity to be able to train with the Finnish team if I wanted to, do camps with them, and I do speak the language, so it makes it a lot easier as as well. And in the future, I do have an opportunity to switch to the Finnish team if I wanted to. So I've definitely gotten a lot of great training in, and the coaches are amazing and very open hand or open armed welcome me into any of their training camps or ski jumping there or whatnot. What would push you to compete for Finland versus the United States? Funding. The U.S. is uh, struggling to find funding for us athletes, which is really big going into seasons. And uh, Finland definitely has more funding for their women. But right now, The women competing for Finland are also very young and mostly compete Continental Cups. So I feel that it wouldn't be the right move right now to do the switch. See, I would switch because when you win in Finland, you get a cake. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Yes. Yes, indeed. Um, I actually competed in Finnish Nationals two years ago and my prize for winning first place was a sack of potatoes. So that's also <laughs> a very good treat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and at the time I was living by myself, so it was amazing because I was like, wow, I'm gonna have potatoes for the year. <laughs> Jill, Jill has a great pierogi recipe. She'll share it with you when we're done. <laughs> oh, perfect. I'll need it. <laughs> I understand the resourcing because I, I follow biathlon, so I understand mm-hmm. like I, I'm guessing when you go to competitions, Norway, Austria, they all have like semi trucks of mm-hmm. oh, gear. Yeah. And then like you roll up in a jalopy. Is that really how it, how it works basically? Yeah, so definitely like bigger competitions. When we were at World Championships 2021 season, I mean, there was huge, huge trucks and it was filled with like wax techs and just you you could see like what other people have as resources. And uh yeah, we, we did show up in a in a van. <laughs> so it yeah. It definitely it, it does go like that. But yeah, you know, there's nothing you can do about it, I guess. <laughs> so other than donating money to USA Nordic, what can fans do to support women's efforts to get in the Olympics for Nordic combined? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I would definitely say, like, through our season, people are looking at the views. So men obviously get a lot more views, like people watching their competitions than women. And I think a great way to support it is, like, watching our competitions. And I can assure you that they're they're definitely not dull. They're super fun. Some of the top athletes, Gita Westwood Hansen, Norwegian, she's killing the game right now. She is um, basically unbeatable. So it's something really cool to be watching and it's a really great way to support us. And then if you're really passionate about it, we could start write, writing letters to the IOC and try to protest our sport into the Olympics. So that's also that's also a really big one and it would support us immensely. What are you looking forward to this season? I had great res- results coming out of last season. So I think I have finally figured out with my t- coach Tomas the p- most productive way for me to train. He's been writing me training plans, which have been awesome, and kind of building an endurance base. So I'm actually very excited. My top goals is p- top six podium. So I think it's very much like I can I can reach that goal. And my best result last season was sixth place. So I'm definitely getting up there. And I'm just really excited to see, like, what's to come in my sport for, like, the future and then also for me. I'm trying to figure out a question based on the finding the training plan that works for you. How long does – I mean, that's a huge process that can take a long time. And you don't necessarily know – how long has it taken to find a training plan for you? So I've been into the I've been in this sport for about four and a half years, I'd say. And training plans are so personal. For me, last season, we my coach and I figured out that running is the solution for me. That's what really builds my endurance. So going into this season, I have been running almost every single day, trying to just like build my endurance and trying to be the best athlete that I can be. So I'd say it's it's something that you and your coach have to figure out and kind of build around that. So like I said, like endurance in endurance way, like running was huge for me, huge. And I I can appreciate running. And I think that that was a big reason why I was getting the results that I was getting last season. What all did you try before landing on running? I'd say that me and my coach have gotten very close to each other to a point where he understands what I need in training and whatnot. So I think it was just also since I did start so late, it was on kind of on me to try to figure out like what worked for me what was my training I had a general training plan but I think that the closer that the athlete and the coach get the better understanding it is for the coach like what what does this athlete need versus just a general training plan for everyone when things go badly do you swear in English or in Finnish Finnish it's more fun (laughs) (laughs) and people don't understand you I mean Finnish is It is one of the hardest languages in the world. So it's definitely Finnish. And it just sounds bizarre. So it's it's more fun to do. (laughs) I was hoping that was going to be your answer. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it's definitely Finnish. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Annika. Thank you so much, Annika. You can find Annika on Insta and TikTok. She is Annika.Malisinski. And we will have links to that in the show notes so on june 24th it's the next ioc executive board meeting and they are going to decide whether or not to include women's nordic combined on 2026 so this is the fun thing because the ioc likes to tout how it's got gender equity but that doesn't necessarily mean gender equality right right and and nordic combined having Ski jump and cross country. Ski jump was only included for women very recently. So the idea of women's Nordic combined didn't even exist. Right. And it's really weird to think that in 2022, we still don't have true gender equality. And and I, I know the IOC likes to massage that word. 
make it look i mean they really do work to make it them look so, very good when you don't have there's you really have to look between the lines and go oh in the winter side no it just because you have the same number of men and women doesn't mean that you've got equality or the same number of events doesn't mean you have true equality and so this is a real black spot where it's so obvious that gender equality is missing so part of the problem for not having women's Nordic combined is that they've said the sport is not so well developed on the women's side. So since 2018, the event has been added to the Junior World Champs, the Youth Olympic Winter Games, and it had its first World Cup series that Annika was in, and it's also been added to the FIS Nordic World Ski Champs. So the women's event really has grown since 2018. And since they've been trying to get it on the, the program. So next week is a big decision. And you can help show how important it is to have a women's equality in this event. So you can reach out to an IOC member. There is a form on olympics.com that we'll link to in the show notes. And you can send a message saying, please vote for Women's Nordic Combined. There is a change.org petition that we will also link to. And you can sign that as well. And then you can post your support for the event on social media, tag USA Nordic, FIS Nordic Combined, US Ski and Snowboard, Team USA, the Olympics, and local and national news outlets with your support or opinion. And we will also have a link to Call to Action that's got all of these things listed that is from USA Nordic Combined. But wait, there's more. <laughs> this... And I could totally see this happening. Uh, listener David alerted us to the fact that there is a distinct possibility that it would be easier to just drop Nordic combined rather than add the women's event to the program. Which, on the one hand, I can see because it's not like events haven't changed, uh, events haven't been dropped in the past. We've talked about ski jumping having to have this whole other facility that's very expensive to build and is that the best use of money but this just seems so heartless in a way uh, oh it does and it's totally blindside larry lage from the associated press wrote yesterday that billy demong who is a five-time olympian and member of usa nordics board of directors said he th heard through back channels loud and clear that this was a solution and was totally blindsided by that concept. Nordic combined is one of the original Winter Olympic sports. It was in the first one. Should it stay on the program? And remember when wrestling got dropped for a hot minute? And that was a big hullabaloo because it was an original sport. But, you know, as you just mentioned, the ski jumping facility is expensive. Why take away an event from using that facility? It feels like... The way a lot of American universities complain about Title IX in that, you know, the real problem with Title So Title IX is the federal law that mandates that universities and schools in general have to equally support male and female opportunities in lots of different areas. And it works in many different ways. The way we talk about it is this forced a lot of American colleges to add funding for women's sports. Problem is that universities use it as an excuse to cut smaller men's programs. Well, oh, we can't afford to do that anymore. Title IX, we got to give the money to the girls. Instead of saying, oh, the real problem is that all the money goes to football and basketball for men. And so if you want equal funding, then you can't fund these smaller sports. So this feels like that same excuse, blame the girls for taking your sports away instead of we need to properly support both sides of this equation. Yes. And I know they're adding ski mountaineering for 2026. So the excuse that, oh, well, we're adding a new sport that already has gender equity it doesn't matter because Nordic Combined has worked really hard to do it. And it's a popular sport in a portion of the world that is, well, it's, it's a popular sport in Europe. And you would be, I, I'm kind of surprised that the IOC, which is still so Eurocentric, would just 
dump this sport that means a lot to a lot of people. I have a feeling this is a political tactic that they're going to threaten to drop the sport. So then you split the Nordic combined community and then they don't have to talk about this anymore. I don't know. Is Avery Brundage still in charge here? I mean, what the heck? <laughs> I feel sick just saying what I just said. But it's really sad that the idea of adding the women's event, even if it adds people to the games, the winter games are still quite small comparatively. So I, I think there is room for some growth and we can have both Nordic combined and your ski mountaineering. You can really, I mean, there's not that many athletes at a winter games. But is it too Eurocentric to begin with? And those sports would be very difficult to spread to other places. You know, I don't know, because remember, who was the first jumper for ski jump in Sochi? An American, our very own Sarah Hendrickson. So I think I, I would not be surprised if some of these sports that have consistently not developed a women's program developed in other countries because of a little bit more freedom. True. Fair. Uh, that sound means it's time for our history moment. And all year long, we were looking back at Albertville 1992 because this is the 30th anniversary of those games. Allison, it is your turn for a story. What do you have for us? I'm so excited about this. <laughs> so I, I warned everybody at the beginning of the year that I was going to talk about ice skating probably the entire year, because there are so many great stories. So we're going to talk a little bit about the ice dance competition. And I'm not even going to talk about the competition, really. I need to talk about some of these pairs, because the characters in this story are out of central casting. It's fantastic. Okay. So the gold medal in ice dance went to Marina Klimova and Sergei Ponomarenko representing the unified team. They were the four-time world champions, and they were very classic, very traditional. Everybody loved them and her incredible flowing red hair, which in their free dance, she wore long, and it was all over the place. It was amazing. And even though the favorites going into the Olympic year were French, the French crowd adored this Russian pair. Now, these were actually Russians. I know we've been sloppy about unified team and Russian and Soviet, but they were actually Russians. And they were the first figure skaters in any discipline to have a complete set of Olympic medals. Oh, really? They won the bronze in 84 and the silver in 88. And currently, they've been married for almost 30 years. They live in California and they coach ice dancers, including their son, Anthony Ponomarenko who with partner Christina Carrera is a rising star on the U S team. So their tradition continues. It gets better. The silver medal went to the French pair, Isabel and Paul Duchesnay, a brother and sister team who were actually Canadian, but competed for France, which is a whole other story. They were the reigning world champions, but they were the avant-garde renegade team. They were the bad boys of ice dance of the time. And for the Olympic season, they had created this program called Reflections, in which they wore pants, both of them, and they were opposites of each other. The international judges hated it. At the European champions, they were like, you cannot bring this to the Olympics. You are not even going to medal. So wait, after the European championships. Be wait, because of the pants? Well, no, just because of the program. Oh, okay. It's just it was too. It was a, a bridge too far for the judges to not being traditional. After the European Championships, they bring back their program from the previous season, revamp it a little bit. It was music from West Side Story, but they really didn't like this program because it was very traditional and conservative. And when they performed it at the Olympics, the French crowd went crazy but it didn't really fly. It kind of fell flat. Both of those programs were choreographed by Christopher Dean, Ooh. as in of Torvalin Dean, 
who was married to Isabel Duchesne at the time. Marriage lasted less than two years, apparently very tumultuous and stormy, fighting all the time, and it caused chaos. Whoa. Yes. We're going to come back to Christopher Dean's marriages when we get to the singles <laughs> competition. So hold that thought for uh, the next couple weeks. Okay, this is where it gets really good. The bronze medal goes to Maya Useva and Alexander Julin, who just beat out the fourth place pair, Oksana Grichuk and Evgeny Platov, also from the unified team. Okay. Both of these pairs returned for the 1994 Olympics. Grichuk and Platov won the gold. Useva and Julin won silver. Later in 1994, the married couple of Useva and Julin announced their divorce. Zulin claimed that their marriage had been a sham to get an apartment and additional benefits from the Soviet government, but with no Soviet system, there was no reason to stay married anymore. Maya Useva claimed that their marriage ended because Alexander was having an affair with Oksana Grichuk. Wow. Both couples continued skating with their respective partners, Useva and Zulin performing in shows but refusing to practice together. And Grichuk, who changed her first name to Pasha after 1994 because she didn't want to be compared to Oksana Bayul, won the gold in 1988 with Evgeny Platov. Wow. (laughs) And I have one final note for this story. (laughs) Eventually, Usava and Julin stopped skating together. So then, for one season, they switched partners on the ice. So it was Useva and Platov and Shulin and Grechak. Wow. How- and then they all retired and moved on. And actually, Alexander Shulin is a very successful dance coach in the United States. Holy cow. I stand so you do not disappoint. <laughs> and that's just the top four. <laughs> Welcome to Shook Flistan. It is time to check in with our team Keep the Flame Alive, our past guests of the show who make up our citizens of the country, Shook Flistan. All right. And follow up from last week, our wheelchair curler, Steve Empt, made the USA wheelchair curling national team. So congratulations to him. Race walker Evan Dunphy finished first in the 10K race at the Harry Jerome Classic with a time of 4038.99. This was about two minutes slower than his time at this race last year, but he mentioned on Twitter that he's still coming back from injury and that finishing this race almost entirely pain-free was the big takeaway from the day. Commentator Rob Snook is currently commentating the Beach Volleyball World Championships and will be calling the Swimming World Championships in Budapest for the CBC. And speaking of Beach Volleyball World Championships, Kelly Clace Chang and partner Betsy Flint finished second in their pool with a record of 2-1, and one, but they lost in the round of 32 to Borga and Suda of Germany 2-1. to one. Former bobsledder Nick Cunningham has been named the full-time head coach for cross-country and track and field and will also be teaching kinesiology at Monterey Peninsula College. Go Coach Cunningham. Oh, I was so excited to see that. Paralympic track athlete and motivational speaker John Register published an article on military transition career advice in the summer issue of U.S. Veterans Magazine. And speed skater Aaron Jackson joined the relaunch of Comcast's Team Up, its corporate in-person volunteer program. She will be part of a STEAM activity day with Lifting Up Camden's youth and will also be part of a career panel and goal setting workshop with Girls Inc., both of which are in the Philadelphia area of the U.S. We're close to novella territory with the basketball situation for Paris 2024. (laughs) Oh, and I actually read something this morning about this. So, oh. Oh, this is great, though. So as we've said before, suddenly the basketball venues that the Paris 2024 organizing committee has selected are a problem with FIBA. They want to move to a new stadium because of the low ceilings in the current one, uh, which are nine meters tall. 
and poor ventilation, and they are worried about the poor ventilation causing havoc in the summer heat, which by 2024 could be really, really hot in Paris. Who knows? So Elliot Brennan reported in Inside the Games, the current stadium replacement contender is Pierre Moroy Stadium in Lille, which is 200 kilometers away, about a three-hour drive. And FIBA is concerned about that because, of course, that takes away the whole Olympic feel that you go to the Olympics before. And they said, quote, we respect the Olympic Games may no longer be able to offer conditions equal to the standard of the World Championships, which in our case is the FIBA World Cup. And also said, we do not feel our athletes should be subject to the conditions we currently have on the table. Interesting. Oh, dear. And they said, well, we can't, we also cannot guarantee that the best basketball players in the world will come if the stadium is in this condition. And Paris hosted Eurobasket 2015, which was a big tournament. And the stadium that they used for that, which was perfectly lovely, has a retractable roof, that got assigned to handball for 2024. So I don't think, I bet FIBA's not happy about that either. Well, this morning on Inside the Games, I read the proposal has been to swap handball (gasps) and basketball to send handball out to Lille and bring basketball back in or to give handball the crummy stadium with the low ceilings and the poor ventilation because obviously the ceiling doesn't matter to handball but the ventilation certainly does but FIBA is trying to kick handball to the curb wow I wonder what handball thinks about that they're going to take a ball to the face is (laughs) So we shall see. Interesting. because <laughs> We love a good federation fight. We've got news about the bids for 2030. But before that, we would like to remind you that next week will be Book Club Week, and it's still time to get driven to ride by Mike Schultz. You can get your copy at bookshop.org slash shop slash flame alive pod and if you're shopping for any kind of summer reading go to that link first because we get a commission for any book you want on bookshop.org but you have to go to the link first to get it to count for us those commissions are extremely important to the lifeblood of the show because it keeps us going and it also helps fund what will be an expensive trip to paris for 2024 should we be able to go and cover the games there for you And at bookshop.org, you are supporting local independent bookshops. Also excellent. So, big announcement this week. Vancouver officially launched the, what they call the engagement phase of its plan for 2030. This is an indigenous-led plan and then also includes local officials and the Canadian Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committees. What they've announced that the Vancouver bid will be three clusters for Vancouver 2010. It was two clusters, but now they've said that there are many more sports since then. So we have to add more. I, I, I see you. <laughs> I see you have thoughts. So they, they were calling them circles in, in indigenous cultures. The circle is a sacred symbol and demonstrates the interdependence of all forms of life. So the bid is being led, uh, in Vancouver, it's the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. In Whistler, it's the Lilwat and Squamish First Nation. The other venue that they're going to add is going to be Sun Peaks, which is, which is just north of Kamloops, which is also like a five-hour drive from Vancouver. There's the Adams Lake, Little Shoe Swap Lake, and Neskumlith Indian Bands there who are leading that project. So... They're basically using a lot of the same venues. They don't anticipate having to build much. The sports out in Kamloops will be freestyle skiing because they said, look, we've got six fields of play. We can get north-facing slopes there. Snow was a big issue in 2010. And though I've heard that Whistler is a huge place and could totally, even with the addition of slope style and some team events, they could probably handle those sports I have a vague recollection that traffic was also an issue going up to Whistler as well so when we're adding more sports and there and then Alpine also added a team event which is another day for that discipline as well so they decided they go to Kamloops I was very concerned about the three clusters 
because we experienced that in Beijing and what a, a nightmare that was. But then I read something today. I believe it was on Inside the Games because they were summarizing the Canadian bid. And it said they also want to have a second option for Alpine events in case of weather issues. That's interesting. The idea being that if there's no snow or if the weather conditions are so poor that which we did experience in Beijing, that they almost didn't get that team event off because of the weather conditions, that in the worst case scenario, they could move Alpine events to that other Alpine mountain site. Interesting. The other thing they were talking about was the fact that regional bids are going to be the way to go. And when you look at Milan Cortina, those two regions are extremely far apart and there have been a lot of olympics where the mountains and the uh ice events have been very far apart i mean we don't the the games are much bigger we don't have necessarily a lake placid anymore well even lake placid got to be far away because the traffic was so bad (laughs) right it physically wasn't far but you couldn't get up to the mountain because unless you were going to hike it, oh, maybe they had mountaineering in Lake Placid <laughs> without even knowing it. <laughs> but yes, you, you're not going to have Lillehammer's anymore where all the ice events, all the, the alpine events are all in this cute little mountain resort town. It, it, the, the summer is the same way. We're going to have to accept that hosts are sprawling. And what does that mean and what does that look like? And in what way can we keep it unified and yet have to adjust for physical space? Right. And if you want more and more sports included to the games, because you want to showcase more sports that people play, there's a breaking line somewhere. They can't all be in one city. And and ski resorts are ski resorts because they don't hold 20,000 people. They are a a getaway and you're getting away from it all. So this will be interesting. In Vancouver, they're going to use Hastings Park, which is a big urban park that has a horse racing track in it. They'll put big air there, short track, figure skating, wheelchair curling, and a medals plaza. There's going to be medals plazas in all circles of the plan. Hastings Park would also have the closing ceremonies for the Paralympics which I thought was interesting that they were going to have the Paralympics opening and all of the Olympic ceremonies at BC Place, but then put the closing in this park. And the park is designed to be like the central place to hang out. So even if you don't have tickets to the games, you can still go to Hastings Park and there will be things in the area that aren't ticketed and you can walk around and get the get the games feel. And that also seems to be the way to go, that they're, that all of the bids... Tokyo was trying to do this. COVID stopped that. Have this urban park where you're a part of the games, even if you're not a part of the games, that the city is truly hosting the games and that the citizens of the city are part and parcel of the vibe. Yeah, so it it does sound like an interesting bid or plan so far. The IOC, a technical committee, has been to visit. They were impressed with the Kamloops site. The organizers of the bid all said if the cities ask for referendums from the citizens, which is a big deal, that might kill the bid. Because in uh, in the presentation I watched, there was a couple of questions from reporters and a lot of dancing around the question until someone finally said, yeah, because we know that the IOC does not like that. That I think is the one issue with the new norm and the new bidding procedure is that the the IOC knows that when things go up to a vote, citizens do not like the idea of the Olympics coming to town because they don't want to pay for it. And they always shoot it down in referendums and that causes cities to drop out. And the IOC does not want that to happen anymore. So I, I think if city councils, and they have a lot to deal with, if they get asked for a referendum, from the citizens, that might not be great, except for perhaps the IOC is going to open up targeted dialogues in December. So that is kind of one of the next steps for this plan. If they get into the targeted dialogue, 
But a city council says in January, hey, we want to put this up to a vote. I think they get through. (laughs) And speaking of referendums, so according to gamesbids.com, the Spanish bid for 2030 is falling apart because Catalonia and Aragonia can't agree. Shocking. So their respective regional councils, city councils, it can't come to an agreement, and that bid is falling apart very quickly. I have also read in various publications that there have been protests about a Sapporo bid from citizens. I, I don't know how much it's it's the No Olympics people, but I, I don't know how big those actually are versus getting press coverage. The Sapporo bid, if I recall correctly wants to use some Nagano venues. And I think they would try to get the sliding center reopened because they don't have a sliding center, that kind of thing. So that was kind of interesting. That would be another very regional bid for Japan. So we shall... Who really wants the games for 2030? Salt Lake City. (laughs) That is correct. Because the IOC has visited Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City has sent a delegation to Switzerland to meet with the IOC. That was Elisa Riley Roche reported in the Desert News. That included Lindsay Vaughn, who is good buddies with t Because she was supposed to meet separately with him along with the delegation. Like, oh, can you imagine, like, being pals in that way? And what's funny, I think Lindsay Vaughn is taller than Thomas Bach. <laughs> So you have this very stunning statuesque blonde coming in and Chibok is just like, hello, (laughs) have a seat. (laughs) Let us talk about Salt Lake City. But they have a very promising bid as well because it's a a lot of reuse of venues. They already have a budget, which they say will be $2.2 which is pretty low. The Canadian plan budget will come out in July. So we shall see. Like we said, target dialogue will be probably be in December with the goal of announcing a host city at the session next. It's at the end of May and spills into June. That will be in Mumbai. Oh, this is fun. Everyone was worried about the new selection process not being horse racy and sort of taking away the, the excitement. I feel like this is so exciting in a way that bidding for the games hasn't been in quite a while. Right, because you have city uh, here you have cities who aren't ready to host not bidding, not having a formal bid, or they're in talks with. They're not putting together this massively expensive proposal and presenting it just to get shut down. I think the big question that has been raised over and over again is LA 2028 is right before 2030, would we have back-to-back American games But there's also the potential that they could award 2030 and 2034 at the same time if you've got a number of bids that are strong enough. So, like, yeah, it is it is kind of wild. Like you say, it's very it's it's still got the thrills. Did not expect that. (laughs) Norm has proved to be quite an exciting date. (laughs) We would like to give a big shout out to our Patreon patrons who keep our flame alive. Find out more about patronage at patreon.com slash flame alive pod. That's going to do it for this week. Let us know if you think women's Nordic combined should be in the Olympics. You can get in touch with us through email at flame alive pod at gmail.com. Call or text us at 208-352-6348. That's 208 flame it. Our social handle is at Flame Alive Pod, and be sure to join the Keep the Flame Alive podcast group on Facebook. If you text us, we do text back. Next week, as we said, Book Club Claire will be back for our discussion of Mike Schultz's Driven to Ride. Thank you so much for listening, and until next time, keep the flame alive. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. 
I am host and producer Cherie Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures.